Amen. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 2 begins with what are seven x-rays that are given to seven local churches. Jesus is giving seven report cards to seven local churches. But looking at these seven letters, we see that it's not just seven letters to seven real churches in the first century, which were in Asia Minor or modern day Turkey, but you could take these seven letters and apply them to every single era of church history even today. When he writes this letter to the church of Ephesus, if you read in the book of Acts, Ephesus was a church that was birthed out of a revival. You say, how do you know it was a revival? Well, when the Bible tells me, tells us, that all of the occultic workers, all of the warlocks and the witches are taking their Ouija boards, their tea leaves, uh, their tarot cards, and setting them on fire in a bonfire in the middle of the city, uh, that's plenty revival to me, should be plenty revival to us. The church began on fire, but... 30 years later, Jesus has John the Apostle pen this letter to them, and he has a message for them. It says, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write this, and the Greek is, write this at once. These things saith he who holds the seven stars in his right hand. And he already tells us in chapter 1 of Revelation that the seven stars represent his seven messengers of, the, of those seven churches, his seven pastors of those seven churches. So these things saith he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who also walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And at the end of chapter 1, it also tells you that the candlesticks are actually, in the Greek, the lampstands, uh, what we would call the menorah, uh, burning on oil, representing the Holy Spirit. The lampstands represent the seven churches. So he says, These things saith he who holds the seven pastors in his right hand, and who also walks in the midst of the local church. He has a message for them and he's introducing himself as the one who's walking around in the local church setting. The one who's walking around right now. He says, I know your works. I know your labor. I know your patience. I know how you cannot bear them which are evil and you've even tried them that say there are apostles and are not and you have found them to be liars. And you have borne and you have patience and for my name's sake you have labored and have not fainted. He mentions patience twice and he mentions laboring twice. The Greek word for laboring means when one is working so hard that they can literally collapse on their face with exhaustion. This was a church that was getting busy. He says the word patience twice. Patience does not just simply mean just merely waiting. It actually talks about waiting when under a burden. Going through trials and simply holding tight and trusting that God will come through and that his timing is perfect. He is noticing these positive things. He mentions laboring twice. He mentions patience twice. You get the idea that this was a church that was well-versed in the scriptures. This was a church that had a great handle of theology. They were able to pick out when false teaching was coming in their midst. They were actually able to discern who was an anointed leader and who was not an anointed leader. They were laboring. They were laboring. They would go through trials. They weren't throwing in the towel. This wasn't a quitting church. This was a church that had stick to This was a church that persevered. And he says, with all of that, nevertheless, nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you've left your first love. He says you got so busy with kingdom work that you've neglected time with the king. You're so passionate about the cause that you've neglected your passion for the king. As a physician, he not only will give the diagnosis, but he'll always give the remedy as well. Remember, 
The diagnosis is you've left your first love. He's saying, I'm walking around in the local church. And just as he said to the Pharisee over dinner, I've been eating with you for how long? And you have not even given me a kiss. And in our culture, we're saying, well, wait a minute. Not everyone is comfortable giving someone a kiss. But in Middle Eastern culture, that was the, the lowest level of a greeting and a hospitality. Basically, to us, it would be the equivalent of a high five. It's like Jesus says to the man, to the, to the Pharisee over dinner, I've been eating with you how long and you've not even given me a high five. And the Lord is saying to the church of Ephesus, I am the one that walks through the midst. I walk through the midst with joy and you gave me no kiss. You gave me no high five. You're all about my cause, but you've ceased to be about me. You're all about Christianity, but you've forgotten that Christianity is a person. As it says in the book of Isaiah, as a belt wraps around the waist of a man, we were created to wrap around him. He's saying, I'm walking around the local church and I'm not finding arms wrapping around me, wrapping around doctrine, wrapping around songs about me, but not saying, you know, no one is grabbing anyone and saying, where is his presence and, and, and how can I feel it and where is he and how can I adore him more? Loving all of the things concerning Christianity, but making the mistake of not loving Jesus, who notices when we're not loving him. So he says, remember the first way out, because we find ourselves here so easily, especially in this day, where Martha fever is everywhere. We read a verse that says the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Well, all right, let's get busy and let's do it. And then before you know it, couple that with a full-time job. Couple that with raising youngins. Couple that with having parents to look after or whatever and just problems and issues. And whatever you couple all of that together, it's so easy to find yourself in a place where you realize, wait a second, I have forgotten, I have forgotten what Christianity is all about first and foremost. And Jesus says, you're doing great stuff. You've got great ministry going on. You are holding the line and you are not budging. You are not compromising one bit. You are no quitter. You are persevering. But with all that, nevertheless, you have forgotten intimacy with me. So, verse 5, how do we get our way out? Remember, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto you quickly. That's sobering. I will come quickly. Doesn't say I will get around to perhaps maybe doing it. I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove your candlestick or your lampstand out of his place, except you repent. Now, is he talking about shutting down a local church for doing this? What does he mean when he says, I'll take away your lampstand? Is he talking about shutting down a local church? If you continue to neglect intimacy with me, you continue to neglect prayer and, 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 and realizing that Christianity is a person and adoring me. And just as the wise men brought gifts, you know, bringing me gifts of praise. It says we will render unto the Lord the calves of our lips. In the New Testament, we don't take animals and throw them on altars, but, but with our lips, we just use them to just bless his name and to blow kisses to him. Is he saying that if you don't do that, I'll shut your church down? What does he mean when he says, I'll remove your candlestick? Well, remember, the menorah, the candlestick, being fueled by the olive oil represented the Holy Spirit. He's saying that if you continue going on with the doctrine and the Christian cause and the mission and ministry and so much to do, but you continue to neglect me as your first love, I will remove the sense of my presence from among you. And you don't have to be saved long to be born Martha's. Well, first we're born sinners, completely independent of God. Then we get saved, but we're still addicted to doing things on our own. So then you become a born Martha, 
And then we learn, learn. Paul even says in Philippians, I have learned. We learn that we really can't do anything without him. We learn that even the days when we wake up and feel strong and the coffee just already meets a mouth that's already energized, even on that day we can't do anything right without him. We learn that. But he's saying that if you don't get this right, I will remove that sense of my presence. And all of us know what it's like to lose that sense of his presence. The Bible says in your presence there's fullness of joy. It says that in your light we shall see light. It talks about joy unspeakable. King David talked about his cup running over. And the question today is, is that sense of his presence something that is absorbing you right now? When is the last time your cup is run over? When is the last time you have been able to say, I truly have just been filled with the Holy Spirit of God by his grace? When is the last time you found yourself saying language like Jesus, you know what, ministry, whatever, all I want is you. It's great. What you let me do is great, but all I want is you. And you start daydreaming about how you can get alone with them, daydreaming about how you can wake up with them, daydreaming about how you can carve out a special time. When is the last time these thoughts have been there? The burden, actually, not just a passing thought, because you could be in the Sunday sermon, and because the topic's preached on, at that moment it becomes a passing thought. But when has it become a burden? When's the last time it's been a burden? In Song of Solomon, we see the picture of the Shulamite looking for King Solomon, which represents the church, looking for Christ and running through the streets saying, have you seen him whom my soul loves? When Christ is holding that place as your first love, it, it, of course, Jesus is the name above all names. Jesus means God saves, but you begin using language just like when uh, in a marriage, you know, the, the n- other names arise other than just their government name because love does that. You see that in Song of Solomon. Have you seen him whom my soul loveth? Then five minutes later, it's another way to describe him. Isn't it so amazing that the Lord loves us so much and he has redeemed us to be with him forever? And what the Lord has invented as the means for us to walk with him, to enjoy him, and to experience heaven on earth so that we can walk a victorious Christian life and not a defeated Christian life to the point where you can say like, Paul, if God is for me, who or what could be against me? To where your problem suddenly becomes small. Our problems can get really big. But the believer that knows how to pray knows how to go. And you remember in the 80s, they had the shrinky dinks. Remember you took these things and you put them in the oven and you just watched them shrink right in front of you. The commercial ran every five minutes. And we go into the prayer closet and we take real things and we're watching them shrink in his presence. Even death itself shrinks. And that's what the Lord has designed. And he loves us so much. Isn't it amazing? He won't settle for less. He won't settle for just religious routine and busyness and Martha. He could have squirrels do what we do if he wanted to. So it's obviously not just the work he saved us for. It's not just the mission he saved us for. He could have birds sing a song and lead people to Jesus. Could he not? Just have people walk through a rainforest and then come out on the other side after hearing a melody of birds and saying, I want to get saved. Yes, he has chosen us to do the work, but he has chosen us to be with him. And we are with him through prayer and we are to be with him as a first love. I'd like to read the same letter, but in the expanded Greek uh, translation. This is by Kenneth Wiest. Greek scholar, went to be with the Lord. Uh, but before he passed away, you can get this on Amazon. It's called uh, the ex- An Expanded Translation, the New Testament, An Expanded Translation by Kenneth Wiest. I'm going to read the same letter. And what he does in this book is he says, the economy of the Greek language is so illustrative, so illustrative that one English word does not suffice. You cannot really operate on a one-to-one ratio, one English word for every one Greek word, and really convey all of what the language is. So he made an expanded translation where he is using as many words as possible to really convey. 
I would recommend you have this. It's great while you're reading your Bible and a verse blesses you to jump over and, and see what it says in this as well. I'm going to read the same letter. He says, to the messenger of the assembly in Ephesus, write this at once. These things says he who is holding fast the seven stars in his right hand. He who is walking about in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know with absolute clearness your works and toil and steadfast endurance and fortitude under trials and that you were not able to endure evil men and you have put to the test those who say they are apostles and are not and you found them to be false. And you have steadfast endurance and fortitude under trials. And you endured persecution because of my name. And you have not become weary. But I have this against you. Your love for me, that earliest love, you've abandoned. Your love for me, that earliest love, you've abandoned. Doesn't that make it clearer of what it means to have left your first love? He's saying that earliest love you had for me, you abandoned. Be remembering therefore from where you fell. The way out first, think back to how it happened. Just as when you're driving and you suddenly find yourself driving in circles and you're in a place that looks nothing like, you know, where you should be, you think back to where you made the first wrong turn. And you may look back and say, well, you know, it began when I just started feeling a little bit self-sufficient. It began when I had just a few Christian victories and didn't realize it, but just started kind of feeling myself a little bit. Or just got really busy and convinced myself that there was no time to actually pray uh, and said stuff like, oh, I just pray in the car when I'm driving, you know. And yes, we should pray at all times, but isn't it amazing how we start making all of these substitutes for what should never replace serious alone time with God. He says, remember from where you fell and at once have a change of mind. That's what it means when he says repent. It doesn't just mean to say, wow, the word got me again. Yes, the word always will get us because it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Repenting does not just mean crying uncle under the light of God's word. It means actually saying, you know what? I've been thinking a wrong way. I can think back to when I began thinking a wrong way and I changed my mind. A lot of people go right back to whatever it is, and we can all relate to that, because we cry uncle under the authority of God's word, but we don't change our mind. We don't change our mind. Walk in the service and walk out so easily without changing our mind. We could say that our mind should change. We should say that, okay, that obviously is truth, but won't change the mind. So he says, be remembering from where you've fallen, have a change of mind. And he says, and the early works perform them directly. So in the King James, it says, remember from where you fell, repent and do the first works. Here he says, remember from where you fell, have a change of mind at once. And the early works perform them directly. Or else I am coming to you and I will remove your lampstand out of his place unless you have a change of mind. He is saying, if you do not have a change of mind, I will take away that sense of my presence. But when he removes the sense of his presence, it is not irrevocable. It is so that you can begin to feel like something's wrong. That is the purpose of him removing his presence. Please don't believe the lie for a moment that you're uh, relegated to the penalty box for the rest of your Christian pilgrimage. And that God's presence is never for you because you've amen this teaching too many times and never made a change. He says, I will remove that sense of my presence when? Until you change your mind. It is designed for you to feel. Just like you can walk into a room and you go home and all of a sudden you can tell that the furnace isn't working. You can tell when you walk in the house, you know, that the AC or the central air is not working. You can walk in the house and just feel something's different. It's designed by love. To cause you to feel something's different. You know, if we say that prayer is to the spirit man what breathing is to the physical man, what happens when we hold our breath? You get dizzy, right? You start making rash decisions centered around making yourself feel better, right? 
Find yourself saying, well, man, I made that decision. Oh, well, you know, I was really lightheaded that day. Well, well, what about when we're not praying? How dizzy are we spiritually? Would it be good right now for each of us to just do an inventory and think, how, how are we really when we're not praying? And the things that we're just kind of sweeping under the rug, the things that come along with not sitting in his presence. Because to sit in his presence is to come away with his fragrance. To sit in yourself is to have the fragrance of flesh. And it's time to take a look now and say, you know what? What does it really look like? Because if you're just gauging it on whether your blood pressure still stays the same or whether your workload at work still stays the same or whether, you know, all your friends still like you, you know, or whether you still get blessings and still get surprise phone calls and still get gifts in the mail. If you're gauging your lack of prayer on, on, just because those things are still in order, that the measuring system is way wrong. We're a spiritual people. But what can happen is without prayer, we start becoming a spiritual people who are still living like material people and find ourselves being no different than Madonna, who's living in a material world and she's a material girl. Spiritual people, by the gospel, because of the gospel, he has made us spiritual people. We're born again, but could be living like material girls and material boys. And the Lord says, hey... I see you're doing all the right things. But that earliest love you had for me, you're neglecting. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2, we see the Lord saying the same thing. Be encouraged because God has had to say the same thing to his people since the beginning. Why? Because all of us are born in sin, born with a rebellious nature, born with a deceitful heart that is desperately wicked, uh, can so easily swear we've got every I dotted and T crossed, leaning to our own understanding, not checking the scriptures, only to realize, wow, I've been... Uh, Missing out on the, on the big thing? He says in Jeremiah chapter 2 the same thing. Remember what he said just now. He said, you've left your first love. What it means is that earliest love you had for me, you've left that. Before we move on, to make this intensely practical, I, I must ask each of you to take a moment and reflect on what your earliest love for Jesus looked like. What did your music selection look like? What did your Bible reading look like? What floated your boat and got you excited? Was it the big things or was it the simplest things? Meeting another believer. Do you remember how when you had that earliest love, how you felt when you met another believer? Yo, hey, yo. Come over, come over, meet someone, and he's a believer. She's a believer. And I was just kind of like, oh, you're, you're a believer? Yeah, I'm a believer. Well, well, do you know what I know? Are you pre-trib or post-trib? Are you a Calvinist? Do you believe the church has replaced Israel? Are you in the replacement theology? You know, and all this stuff. And, but in the beginning, like, it was just, wow, a believer. We're going to be in heaven forever. And the first time you're able to say to someone, hey, if I don't see you again, I'll see you in heaven. And you're all tickled. And then we get good at this. We get knowledge under our belt. And the things that used to excite us don't excite us. Just like a great adventure, they have to build better and better roller coasters. We start needing bigger and bigger things to get excited. Oh yeah, that ministry last year was cool, but, you know, but this now. Oh yeah, you know, it was great to lead a person to Christ, but how can I get in front of millions now? Jeremiah chapter 2, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me and said, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem and say this, Thus says the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your espousals, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. He says, Go and tell Israel this, I remember the honeymoon love you had for me. And look at this. The honeymoon love, the love of your youth, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown, when you would do 
anything I asked and you would go anywhere. You didn't need to know would there be air conditioning there or not. You didn't need to know, well, how long will it be and how much will it be and how much can I work it into my time or not? How many people will be there or not? How hard will it be or not? How dangerous will it be or not? What will I get out of it? I mean, well, if I do that, will I have a moment to do what I want to do? If I listen to them share, will I have a minute to share? You would go through any wilderness. You would go through a land not sown. You would go places even if I said food, basic necessities may not even be there. You would go in any wilderness or anywhere. There were no conditions. You loved me unconditionally and you would do whatever I asked with no conditions. He then says, verse 13, my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they've also hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. He's saying they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and instead they are drinking the way the world drinks. They are no longer coming to me to get refreshed. They are, they're, they're attempting to refresh themselves the way the world does. Stagnant water in leaking pots. Fleeting pleasures, fleeting refreshment, not real refreshment. They've exchanged real refreshment for fleeting temporary refreshment. They've exchanged a cup that runneth over for a cup that just gets a little visitation here or there. They've exchanged joy unspeakable for just one smile in church is enough. And he says in Psalms 81, verse 10, I am the Lord God that brought you out of Egypt. You open your mouth wide and I will fill it. But we have to remember what he wants to fill us with is more of himself. The Pharisees could quote more Bible than every person in this building. Yet could not even recognize when the word made flesh was right before them knew more theology, could tell you more about the Shekinah glory than anyone else, but could not even recognize the Shekinah glory right before them and the absence thereof in their lives. The commandment is still in my Bible. The commandment is still in your Bible. And we must repent every time we read it. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. Then you will love your neighbor as yourself. Let's go to Genesis chapter 35, and this is where we're going to close. Because we're complicated people. That's how sin has rendered us. Praise God, though, that God does not see complication when he looks at us, nor complexity. We feel like a complicated mess. He sees very black and white. And that's when we come to church and sit before the word. His word goes forward. And it, what we think is so deep and so, how will I get to the bottom of this? The word just goes straight and it just separates what is of him and what is not of him. What is surrender and what is not surrender? What is religion and what is relationship with him? What is intimacy with him? And what is just being satisfied with knowing about intimacy with him? Genesis 35, Genesis 35. It's one of my favorite chapters that displays the gospel. And please understand... If you want to get to the bottom, if you really want to get to the bottom of why you're experiencing hindrances in prayer, why you're not getting answers to prayer, why prayer feels boring, why prayer feels like, you know, your conscience feels cool because your conscience knows you're doing what you ought to do, but you're not seeing something that you can really say, wow. I've got the bird in the hand and the two in the bush on the way. If you're wondering why your praying is lacking that kind of boasting, that kind of joy, a lot of times you will find the answer in a simple thing. Is Jesus your first love? Are you seeking to make Jesus your first love? Are you, you know, before anyone prays, you get down to business, right? Got to repent of some sin. Got to get your head right. That's what Jesus means when he says, go in your closet and shut your door. Take a minute and get your head right. 
Because we get jacked up real quick. Even in the name of religion. Don't think you, you got to be hanging out here or there to get jacked up. You'd be right in the middle of the church and get jacked up. But looking phenomenal on the outside. Like Billy Crystal looking marvelous. But be all jacked up. So before we're going to pray, you got to get your head right. But getting our head right centers around holding Christ as our first love. And you will find your prayer language, your prayer life is all of what the scriptures is laying out when you're making that the main thing. Somebody asked this question. How do you reconcile hindrances to prayer and our action or inaction with the gospel message? Someone asked that question when we passed around the four by sixes. Um, what a great question. What a great question. How do you reconcile hindrances to prayer and our action or inaction with the gospel message? Now, I won't ask for a show of hands, but who has experienced hindrances to prayer? Oh, yeah. Who has experienced when it feels like the heavens are made of brass? Oh, yeah. You ever play wall ball where you throw the ball and it comes back to you? Handball, racquetball, any kind of ball? Who knows what it feels like for your prayers to feel like you're playing wall ball with your words? Boom, Lord, boom, right back in your hand. Lord, give me peace, boom, right back in your hand. Sometimes you feel like it comes down so fast it's turning the dodge ball now. You threw up a prayer, now you got to dodge it. Because you just feel like it came back so fast. What's going on here? We all know hindrances to prayer. But are we studying what the Bible says to do with those hindrances to prayer? You go in urgent care. Everything there is urgent. You're hoping that the doctors there are all specialized in handling things that need urgent care. Are we being discipled? Are we getting in the word so that we understand the urgent care? What to do? If I'm bleeding, if I'm cut, if I'm hurt, if I go to urgent care, I don't want to go to ur Being in urgent care and waiting for four hours is a contradiction. Going to urgent care and the help at the desk on their phone and on the, on, on the whatever. That, that's a contradiction. I, I want something urgent with our hindrances. Do we know what urgent care looks like? Because when you've set aside a time to pray and you've set aside a time to get with the Lord, you're planning to get with the Lord. It means that you need some urgent care. Something that can happen in a minute. Something can happen in 30 seconds, two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes. You need urgent care. Do we know what urgent care looks like when we're finding ourselves in a place where we have left our earliest love for the Lord, where we have just been so busy with all of it, where we have lost that sense of his presence? There's some here today. You can't remember the last time you've sensed his presence. But please know this, and this is a day to call the devil a dirty liar. This is penned and spoken by the one who loves us so much that he says, I will pursue you and I will cry aloud and I will raise up the prophet. I will raise up the preacher to continue to let you know how much I love you. And the thing is, it has to be a work of God. How do you reconcile hindrances to prayer based on our action or inaction with the gospel message? Is there a relationship between hindrances to prayer and the gospel message? Yes or no? Undeniably yes every time. We talked about how in the Old Testament, when there was the altar where the animal, the lamb, was offered up, you need coals to have a fire. The coals that burned the lamb, consumed the lamb, coals represent judgment. The lamb is slain, representing the covering for man's sin. Inside of the tabernacle was an altar of incense. In order to consume a lamb, you need hot coals, you need fire. In order to burn incense, you need fire. The fire for the incense, which represents prayer, 
came from and only could come from one place. The priest could not go and open a bag of charcoal, nor could he borrow a lighter from anyone to light that incense, to send off that prayer. He could only go to one place, and that place was to the very coal bed that was consuming the lamb. What is that saying? That all of the fuel for our prayers must always come from our meditation on God loving us so much that he gave his son to die for our sins. And that no matter how much our heart is condemning us, no matter how much of an idiot we've been, no matter how much we have acted more like Judas than we could ever put to words, you are realizing as that priest is bringing the coals, he's carrying it in his hands, realizing these are hands that have once been vile hands, maybe hands that have been vile lately, a mouth saying hello or good morning to people, or shalom, shalom, a mouth that has said the most perverse things, eyes that are walking over there that have set the, the eyes and the gaze on wrong things. The person is realizing it is a sinner Nothing but a low-down sinner who has every right to be banished, condemned, exiled from God's presence forever. But he is carrying something that says something different. He's carrying something that says that though he deserves the worst, God is giving his best and giving Jesus and, and sins being judged by an innocent substitute because of love. This is a sinner coming there, maybe on the way there, heart condemned, forgetting the gospel, forgetting God's love. Just so good at just, just looking at just head to toe, just wrong. You ever just felt wrong head to toe? But yet grabbing something that immediately is saying the very opposite of everything you're thinking or feeling and everything the devil could be saying in your ears. Love. Some judgment, yes, you deserve it, but something's been judged in your place. Someone's been judged in your place. And by the time that call was put on the prayer, it was beginning, how could it not begin with a language of, whew, how could it not begin with a language of, Thank you, Lord. How could it not begin with the language of I'm so undeserving? How could it not begin with the language of I'll never understand this? How could it not begin with the language of I love you? How can you love me like this? How could it not begin with the language of when I consider the sun and the moon and the stars and the animals? What is man? Why do you even, you eight billion people on the planet, why did you elected me? The gospel must be. There is an, an inextricably linked relationship between the gospel and overcoming hindrances to prayer. If you don't make the gospel the foundation of your prayer life, you will only know hindrances. Then you start trying to fight the hindrances in your own strength. Then prayer, instead of being a thought of something relaxing to you, it's actually a thought of something that makes you more tired or stresses you out because you're trying to overcome the hindrances in your own strength. Amen? Genesis 35. Genesis 35. How can we do this in 10 minutes? Jacob. Let's just begin and say that name. Jacob. Okay? Jacob. Hustler. Hustler. Passive-aggressive, but he proved that passive-aggressiveness is still real aggression. A schemer. Trust God, maybe next time. Today, scheme. When he was born, he was born with his twin brother, had a unique birth, and that his brother came out first, and Jacob comes out holding his brother's heel, so they called him the heel catcher, meaning basically supplanter the one in the foot race that you don't want behind you because if you were in first he will trip your heel and you will be in second assuming you even get up from the fall and even get to cross the finish line he's given this promise or at least his mom and dad are given the promise that though he's a supplanter that that he will have the messianic blessing that he will have the birthright we see him scheming from the door his older brother, who usually the older brother got the birthright, his older brother doesn't care anything about that birthright. And instead of trusting that what God promises God is able to perform, Jacob schemes and hustles him out of it. He's the kind of guy that if you rolled dice against him, or rolled CeeLo or craps against him, and four, five, six wins in CeeLo. I, I never gambled a day in my life. I just heard other people that do, right? 
He's the kind of guy that would have one dice that was all fours, one dice that was all fives, and one dice that was all sixes. Praise God for the gospel. That's what I used to do as well. But, you know, every time you roll, it's four, five, six, and then you pick it up quickly so people can't see that on other sides of the dice, it's whatever, right? Anyway, that's what he was. He hustles his brother out of the birthright. His brother wants to kill him. His mother basically says, you need to run for your life because your older brother is a marksman. He's a hunter. He has anger issues and he's going to kill you just for a few days. Just go to my brother Laban's house. Jacob is now lonely. It says in the scriptures that he was a man that dwelled in the tents. His brother was the outdoorsy guy. This guy is outside with the beasts and the animals. This guy in Genesis 28 is using rocks for a pillow. He has... No one around him. He has no idea what his future holds. All he knows is that he has burnt a big bridge behind him. He lays down on a stone. He's on this 500 mile journey. God sure knows how to get a person alone, doesn't he? Some of you right now, God's getting you alone. And while the enemy wants to convince you that you're being forsaken by God, it is actually God's way of drawing you nearer to him than you have ever known. If you will just choose to believe the Bible and not lean into your own understanding and believing other things. He's laying on a pillow. Please go to Genesis 28. And it says in verse 12 that he dreamed a dream. And in this dream, he sees a ladder that going all the way up to the throne, he sees a ladder connecting earth to the throne. John chapter 1, verse 51, Jesus makes clear that he is that ladder. Not only is it a ladder, but there's angels ascending up it and angels coming down it. And at the top of the ladder, the Lord stands there, speaks to Jacob and promises blessings upon his life, promises to never leave him, promises to keep him. Let's look at this. Verse 15, behold, I'm with you. I will keep you in all places. Underline all. Part of the Christian walk and in recognizing and realizing the faithfulness of God is that when he says all, he means all. Not just the places when you're on your A game either. Where can I flee from your presence, the psalmist said. You'll fail him a million times, but he'll never fail us. I will keep you. I am with you in all places where you go. I will bring you again to this land. I will not leave you till I've done that which I've spoken to you of. Let's read that one more time, please. It would almost be good to read it aloud. Behold, I'm with you. I will keep you in all places where you go. Where have you been since you've called on the name of the Lord? I'm talking the good, the bad, and the ugly places. He said, I'll keep you in every one of those places. And he says, I'll bring you again to this land and I won't leave you till I have done which I have spoken of. I won't give up on you. I won't let go of you until I take every hard part of you and tenderize it and make it into the likeness of my son. Jacob awaked out of his sleep, verse 16, and said, wow, the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. The first thing Jacob realizes is that God is with him even when he does not think he is. Hello. Hello. Anyone here feeling estranged and just, wow, the Bible says you can't lose your salvation, but I sure feel like I lost mine. I'm in the middle of such confusion and unfairness and wickedness. Where is God? Jacob woke up and said, wow, I'm in the middle of a desert surrounded by nothing but animals and a rock for a pillow. God was here. God was here. Where is he? Nights where I said, where are you? He's right here. He's just not in the little box I've put him in. So Jacob trembles and he goes. And let me fast forward. Jacob now is born again. This represents a born again experience. I love verse 12 says that he dreamed a dream. Because imagine if it said, and Jacob sat on a rock and thought a thought. Who would have taken the credit for this experience? What if it said, Jacob sat on a rock and said, hmm, a thought, a ladder, angels going up and down, God on the top. Who would have taken the credit? But it's a dream. 
when you are totally most vulnerable and not in control of your thoughts, God initiates it. God comes to him at his lowest point with full intelligence of who he is and with full intelligence of how badly he's going to blow it for the next 30 years still chooses him, still makes promises like this over his life. Amen? I'm so excited right now with God's goodness in this message that I'm going to need someone to say amen really loud before we're done. But you, you pick the timing, okay? He moves on. Jacob goes and stays with his uncle Laban for 21 years. No mention of a prayer life. No mention of a prayer life. But his life shows it. He has a dysfunctional home. He's got kids that are wiling out. You get the sense that there's this civility. There's a veneer of this civility. But underneath it's all of this dysfunction. Can, can anyone relate to that? He's not leading his home. When he finally decides to leave, why? Because please go to Genesis chapter 31 and look at verse 3. The Lord says, return to the land of your fathers and I will be with thee. Look at what God's doing, showing up and saying, I'll be with you. Hey, come on back. Hey, come on back. 21 years with no mention of a prayer life on Jacob's part. But here God is still calling him to come back to what it's all about having his first love, and a life of prayer. When he's coming back, basically it says his uncle Laban pursues him, and Jacob's wife has all of these idols. There's not only dysfunction in the family, but because there's no prayer in the family, and because everyone has lost their first love, there's dirty little secrets going around. She's got idols. Jacob doesn't even know it. It says in verse 32 at the very end, Jacob knew not that Rachel had stolen idols. If you ever want a story that will scare you into praying, read the story of Jacob to see what happens when you scheme so well and never give up and you're such a fighter, but because there's not prayer, there is not God's best. We see Genesis 32 where God really gets Jacob alone. And please look at verse 24. Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till the breaking of the day. That was God showing up. God won't give up on us. That's what makes and finally converts a Christian, if you will, to loving the Lord all the more, loving prayer all the more, when you realize that no matter how much we fail, no matter how much we mess up, there is one who does not relent in pursuing us and wrestling with our independence, wrestling with our stubbornness, wrestling with the ugliest parts of us to finally just cave in and sit at his feet and let him be our wonderful Lord and Savior in every way he desires to be. He basically changes Jacob's name to Israel. Verse 28, your name will not be called Jacob anymore, but it will be called Israel. It goes, he says, your name is no longer Hustler. Your name is now Israel. It means one who's governed by God because you're finally surrendering. Even though he came to do it through a moment of weakness. Isn't it something that God usually has to strip us of something before we'll actually cling to him? frustrate our plans majorly in some way, give us a limp, show us that we're just clay, all of a sudden your health crumbles, you went from being Mr. Universe or Miss Universe to all of a sudden now, you know, you need, you need help walking uh, uh, across the room. Usually he has to show us our frailness. It says in the Psalms, make me to know how frail I really am because we can get it really twisted, especially when you go to work all day and everyone's telling you how awesome you are and how strong you are. He says, your name is Israel now. You would think this is the end of the story, but it's not the end of the story. It's not. You would think that finally, okay, 21 years of no devotional life, dysfunctional home, his wife's got dirty little secrets, he's got dirty little secrets, the kid's got dirty little secrets, he's finally 
grabbed a hold of the Lord, the Lord knights him and says, imagine if God says to you, you are no longer a schemer. You are now one who I can look to who will be conformed to my will. You would think it's the end of the story. It's not. You would think, how many of you have experienced an outpouring of God's spirit? Experienced a touch? Had a, an encounter with God and you said, I will never change again. Only to then find out how big of a failure you really could be. He comes out of that experience scheming even more than ever. But what's amazing is that God would still bless him knowing that, that was, he was going to do that next. He schemes with Esau, chapter 33. Chapter 35, chapter 34, verse 17, he goes to Sukkoth, goes to the bad side of town, goes to the red light district. He's supposed to be a pilgrim passing through like Abraham and Isaac. He decides to start buying real estate. No one told him to buy real estate in the red light district. It says, verse 17, he journeyed to Sukkoth and built a house there. Well, his daughter Dina goes out, and obviously there's been so much going on. There's no prayer in the home that she's obviously looking for love in the wrong places. She's going out probably trying to look a little sexy. The Canaanite guys take a liking to her. Rape her. Jacob's two oldest sons go and kill all those guys. Jacob basically says, verse 30, and look, here's a man who just a few chapters ago had an experience of, Lord, I'm yours. The Lord says, yes, you are. Your name is not schemer. You are governed by God. And look at how quickly he descends into being a self-centered person with the weight of the world on his shoulders as though prayer doesn't even exist. He says, Jacob says to Simeon and Levi, when he realizes that they went and killed all those guys, he now is, is, is next door neighbors, got his real estate. He was never told to buy a house by God, never told to settle down by God, but to keep it moving. But he just wanted to have a little bit of heaven and a little bit of the world and a little bit of God's way and a little bit of the world's way. And he says to them, you have troubled me to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and I being few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I will be destroyed, I and my house. Look at his language. I, me, 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 I, me, me. Wow. No wonder it says in Genesis 35, and God said to Jacob, but wait a minute, I thought his name was just changed to Israel three chapters ago. He ain't acting like a man governed by God. He's acting like Jacob. And God calls him Jacob again. Hey, Jacob. I love this. And remember we began the message with losing your first love. Look at what the Lord does. He's always inviting us back. Hosea talks about bands of love bringing us back. Someone asked the question, how do you reconcile? Do you reconcile hindrances to prayer with the gospel? Yes, the only way to overcome hindrances, the flesh, sin, and have a victorious prayer life is on the foundation of the gospel. That's why you got to preach the gospel daily to yourself. When's the last time you've preached a full gospel to yourself? I'm talking gave yourself a full sermon. Started with Genesis 3 and preached the gospel to yourself until you felt like you got saved all over again. You've got to do that. God said to Jacob, arise and go to Bethel. Wait a minute, Bethel, where was Bethel? Bethel is where he first met him with the ladder. He says, go back to Bethel. And dwell there. Ooh. Someone else asked this question and said, Is it okay to sit in silence when you don't know what else to pray for after a few minutes of praying? Oh, there's your answer right there. Go back to Bethel. Go back to where we met. 
Do you get it? Jesus said in John 1.51, he is the ladder. He is the mediator, 1 Timothy 2.5. He is the connection between heaven and earth. A ladder has two poles. No doubt, Jesus the ladder. One pole, all gold, representing his deity. One pole, all silver, representing his humanity. Every rung in the ladder, the story from the babe in Bethlehem to his resurrection and ascension on the right hand of the Father where he ever lives to pray for us. Oh yeah, he is the ladder. And he says, go back to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar. Make an altar. Talk to me. Make an altar to God that appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Wow, look at that. Hey, Jacob, come back to where it all began. Come back to where it all began when you had nothing to your name. Lose your title, Jacob. Lose your accomplishments. Your real estate in Sukkoth, forget about it. Your accomplishments, forget about it. Your farming business, 21 years with Laban, forget about it. Come back to when you had nothing. Because without me, you have nothing. And everything you have is from me. Become nothing again. And come back to when you saw me as everything. You see a lot of Christians get caught up in holding Jesus as everything, lowercase e, but also holding themselves as something too. He says, come on back. And look at what Jacob says. Jacob's ready. Jacob has had enough. The question is, is there anyone that's had enough? And realizing that all things work together for good. All things. He didn't say all things are good, but all things work together for good. And look at what he says to his family. Put away the strange gods that are among you. Let's clean up shop. Change your clothes. Yes, we see the Lord say in the word, change your heart and not your garments. Changing clothes doesn't symbolize anything if the heart doesn't do it. But change your clothes, representing that you're changing your heart too. We've got to put some stuff away. Maybe part of the reason that Jacob had that experience in Genesis 32, where he had that amazing surrender, that amazing experience with God, but could go back so quickly, is even though God blessed him, he never put some stuff away. You can have some stuff in your heart, and believe me, nothing can stop God. God can bless your heart and consume you in his fire of love while your heart is full of idols. But if you don't start putting stuff away, then it's just simply louder heavenly music drowning out dirty crazy music that's still on but for the moment it's just being consumed in that but when the experience goes away you've not put anything away so that music is right there that stuff is right there he says you know what put it away put away the strange gods change your garments let's arise and go to Bethel and I'm gonna make an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress. It says in Isaiah, don't forget the rock you've been hewn from. I'm going back to the Lord and to where I was when he saved me. Now, amazingly, it was a nondescript piece of desert. Where did you first get saved? A nondescript altar? One like this? No flowers, no nothing? Just some carpet that we try to keep clean? Was it... A bar, your bedroom, in a car with a friend, coffee shop, jail cell. He says, you know what? I'm going back to where I first saw that ladder. <clears throat> Verse 4, and they gave unto Jacob all their strange gods which were in their hands and all the earrings in their ears. Nothing against earrings, but obviously this was earrings coupled with idolatrous worship. And Jacob hid them under the oak which were by Shechem. What did it say he did? He buried it. He buried it. And it didn't say that he took it with him and said, I'll bury it when I get to Bethel. I'll bury that stuff during the sermon. He buried it in Shechem and left it there. And they journeyed in verse 5. I love this. Remember he just talked about having a million and one enemies? Would you write this in your notes? God will always blaze a trail for you to get back on track with him. 
Because it's like, Lord, wait a minute, I'm in debt, I'm in a bind, I'm in trouble, it's crazy. I've I've, I've created a big mess, there's drama, my head is noisy, I can't think straight, I, 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 I can't get this demonic thing off my back. It says, look, as they journey, underline this verse 5, the terror of God was on the cities that were all about them. God so blazed a trail for him to get back. He made it easy for him to get back. He put terror on everyone. And those were some bad boys he was putting terror on. I don't know what could strike more fear in the human heart than some nomadic demon worshipers. I'm not talking some trendy demon worshipers like you might find in a city where it's a little trendy to go golf. I'm talking some nomadic, raw, nasty, human sacrificing, sticks and stones won't break my bones, demon worshipers, and God puts a terror on everyone Jacob walks by. People that would have just taken a javelin just for a throw on GP. He blazes a trail. Jacob deserves something very different, but he's getting grace. And this is how a family comes back into revival. And look at this. We got to end here. Let's have the worship team come up. Verse 9. God appeared to Jacob again when he came out of Padam Aram and blessed him. And check this out. He repeats the same stuff he said to him. How many here have ever been tempted to feel like you blew it? ever been tempted to feel like you blew it? You can go on being a Christian. You can even do ministry. But as far as your cup running over, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, beginning a ministry beyond what you've ever even begun, you feel like you've blown it in some way. Look at this. After 21 years of no prayer life, dysfunctional family, dirty little secrets all throughout the family, having a great experience with God, only to go and fail even worse afterwards, Look at what God says in verse 9. God appeared to Jacob and said, verse 10, your name is Jacob, but your name will not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel will be called your name, and your name is Israel. He repeats to him the same goodness that he said on the other side of all of those failures. And God said, I'm God Almighty. Be fruitful. Fruitfulness, yeah, That's still what I got for your life. What, Lord? All I've done is failed. All I've done has been wrapped up in myself. All of fruitfulness is same topic of convo, same grace, same promises, same greatness for your life. Because Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to bless you and not to curse you, to give you an expected end. And he says, and I will make you a nation and a company of nations will be of the kings will come out of your loins. And the land I gave Abraham and Isaac, to you will I will give it, and to your seed after I will give it. Jacob, you're Israel again, and guess what? You're still trustworthy. I still am going to take all the chance with you. I'm still going to put my glory all over your name. I still have that anointing on you. What happened in Genesis 32, you failed me, but I never took it back. Wow. What a great message on hindrances to prayer. Last week's message was on sin, excuses, right? And how the Bible says you must, to have a fruitful prayer life, you must have a prayer life that's walking in regular repentance. Psalm 66 says, if I hold sin in my heart, God won't hear me. A hindrance to prayer is having something in your heart you know is not right. Idols in your heart you know is not right and not wanting to give it up. It says you will not. But then what this does is it gives you a story of grace. For every New Testament principle, there's an Old Testament picture of what it looks like. You're like, well, idols, I don't really get the idols thing. I mean, isn't that kind of old talk, Old Testament talk? What do idols look like today? Well, idols definitely are something, because would you turn to 1 John, and that's our last reference. 1 John, which is a book about fellowship with God. It's a book without, about prayer with God that, that leaves you with joy unspeakable. Why, if idols is something only to be discussed in an Old Testament context, Why does 1 John, the book about how to have an amazing prayer life, end with this verse? 1 John 5, 21. My little children, keep yourself from what? 
idols. So it's not an Old Testament phenomenon. It might just look like different things today. Let's talk about idols. Let's talk about material idols. Let's talk about iPhones. Let's talk about smartphones. Let's talk about cameras. Let's talk about what the human heart likes to do when it connects with some of these things, which is why Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart. It doesn't say you can't have these things, but don't let these things have you. And a lot of Christians have to be honest and say, I don't have this. I own this, but it's a two-way street. It also owns me. Hello? We're all talking to one another in this room, right? Material idols. A person. Whoever. Emotional idols. Bitterness. Anger that you won't let go. Self-pity. Some people can make an idol out of feeling sorry for themselves. So much so that they act as though their sorrows eclipse what Jesus went through to save them. Idols of uncleanness. Lust. Pride. The question is, are we ready to bury these things under the oak tree? And it means at the scene of the crime. See, it doesn't say he went back to Bethel where the ladder appeared and buried them there. No, he buried them right where his, his daughter got caught up in dirt. And that was his fault. His sons got caught up in dirt. And that was his fault. He shouldn't have bought property there. Okay? He buried it at the scene of the crime. That requires boldness. A lot of people, well, uh, what I did was so wrong and how I think is so wrong. I just got to run from it. It overwhelms me. The Bible says perfect love casts out all fear and God's not giving you a spirit of fear. You face it in the power of knowing that Christ was judged for that. There is no fear, only rejoicing. It says that mercy rejoices over judgment. We've received mercy because Christ was judged in our place. But you bury it right there in the middle of your feelings, in the middle of your whackness, in the middle of your religiosity, in the middle of your pharisaicalness, in the middle of loving all of church and doctrine, having theology books from here to their room and back, but not having a prayer journal. Studying all the doctrine in the scriptures. But can't remember the last time you just brooded over the Psalms. And said, my Lord. My Lord. My Lord. Can't remember the last time you just said to Jesus, I love you so much. When's the last time you told Jesus you loved them? Took 10 minutes just to let him know you love him. So what you do is right at the scene of the crime, you take those idols, you remember from whence you fell, and you bury them right on the spot. Not later, not at the end of the song, not next communion message. You bury them there. Lord, my idols. What about idols of dreams and ambitions? Idols of agendas. That's perhaps one of the trickiest ones because it's something that we want to do for the kingdom. How do you know if it's an idol? Does the Lord have the right to take it away from you? Or all of a sudden, does your grip get tighter on it? And there's a tug of war. Amy Carmichael said, hold all your ministries with an open hand. So if the Lord should ever choose to take it from you, there's no tug of war. Idols. Keep yourself from idols that will hinder your prayer life and keep Jesus from being your first love. Whew. Good message for us to embark on going through the scriptures together. Idols of career. Idols in the workplace. The ugly idols are easy to locate. What about the idols that come along with, in the name of just doing what you do? What is an idol? An idol is anything that takes the place that Jesus Christ should have in your heart. Anything that takes the place that Jesus should have in your heart. Jesus should have a place in your heart where he gets the pinnacle of your excitement, the pinnacle of your joy, the pinnacle of your focus, the pinnacle of your honesty, the pinnacle of all of that. Anything that takes that place. And to be in this flesh, we will have to battle with contenders. 
to have a heart like ours, contenders are going to want a shot at the belt. Along comes pride, I want a shot at the belt. Right? Along comes lust, I want a shot at the belt. Along comes anger, you're, you're just angry with somebody, I want a shot at the belt. Anything that wants to take the throne of your heart, your time, your energy, your passion, over the place of Jesus is an idol. And let me tell you what, the church in America is full of idolatry. And everything's looking so right. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to take away that sense of my presence, which is why you have so many Christians that know so much Bible, but don't know much about the presence of God. But all of what we will really do for the kingdom, all of what will really happen, it comes from being in his presence. That's where it comes from. The miracles, the blessings, the power, the healings, the touches, the kingdom of darkness being broken. It all comes from his presence. Much prayer, much power. Little prayer, little power. It'll always be true. Let's bury some stuff, amen? Ready to bury some stuff? At the scene of the crime. You can make an idol of your pain. But every time I think, oh, you just get caught up in the whirlwind of it. We've all been through pain. We know how that can happen. You can make an idol of your pain. Let's bury some stuff at the foot of the cross and celebrate Jesus as a forgiver. Celebrate Jesus as a healer. A healer. Anybody want some healing? Amen. Need to be healed of some stuff. Jesus asked a question in John 5. Do you want to be made whole? Do we want to be made whole? Father God, we love you and we thank you so much, Lord. Lord God, we thank you for bringing a message that brings us face to face with to pray in power and biblically or to just say religious prayers. Lord, we choose door A and we thank you for giving us a message that is mandatory for the believer who wants to see right, breathe right, think right, feel right, and be right. Lord, please teach us to pray more and more. Would you allow all of your word to do a work in our heart? Would you do a work in us? Lord, would you give us a fresh hatred of sin? Lord, would you give us a fresh hatred of idolatry? Lord, thank you for reminding us what Christianity is all about. As you said in 1 Corinthians 6, you were bought with a price. Your life's not even yours anymore. Things we once loved, but we could fall in the trap of trying to figure out how can we really make Christianity ours in Jesus' name. Lord, we want to bury some stuff. We want to bury some stuff. We want to bury some stuff. You said the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us put away. Let's put aside the sin that's easily tripping us up. Looking unto Jesus, the latter, the author and finisher of our faith. And the latter with the angels ascending up and coming down, prayers going up, blessings coming down by the ministering spirit sent forth to minister to the heirs of salvation. Lord, even you in that image is a relationship. Prayers ascending, blessings descending. Prayers ascending, blessings descending. Prayers ascending, blessings descending. Lord, we want the economy of the victorious Christian life. Would you burn in our souls, Lord, a love for prayer, real prayer, biblical prayer, straight up prayer, like we've never known. We love you and love the gospel. Thank you for reminding us the gospel is everything. In Jesus' name we pray. And Lord, we also pray, we also do pray that as worship, you would receive this afternoon's offering of all you've given unto us. Thank you that we could give to you now even as worship. Give us wisdom in all of what we do with this offering for the furtherance of your kingdom and the giving forth of your word, both in these four walls and throughout this city and region and country. Receive our gift. Receive our praise in Jesus' name. Amen.